Every year in the middle of the spring, a strange hunt takes place in the lagoon of Fuente de Piedra in southeast Spain. At dawn, a perfectly coordinated line of men and women walks along the banks of the salt lake. It's the breeding season of the greater flamingos, and just two months ago, thousands of new chicks came into the world. In a few days' time, the young flamingos will be able to fly, setting out on their journey towards North Africa. And it is in this period, just before they leave, that the Environmental Agency and the Doñana Biological Station work together to catch, study, and ring the new generations of flamingos. The Fuente de Piedra Lagoon has the largest breeding colony of greater flamingos in Europe, with over 12,000 couples. The studies carried out thanks to these captures have enabled scientists to understand more about the species, revealing the value of a seasonal lagoon which had previously been considered a wasteland. What had previously appeared to be a barren, unhealthy place is now, in the light of this research, revealed to be a vital spot for the survival of the European flamingos. These brackish waters teem with single-cell algae and tiny crustaceans, which become the food for thousands of flamingos during the delicate breeding season. Many years of effort by nature-loving volunteers have managed to change public opinion. What was considered a source of diseases, a lagoon most people considered should be drained, has become an integral nature reserve admired by the public, a guarantee for the survival of the European flamingos. altered ecology and alarming environmental deterioration. But just when the process appeared irreversible, new winds of hope have begun to blow from every corner of the earth. Now we know that the protection of our environment, of our ecology, is a global task in which all living beings and their surroundings are interrelated and interdependent. Every individual is important, each species is unique and unrepeatable, and each ecosystem is a complicated structure enabling life to continue. Science is demonstrating that protecting biodiversity is an obligation in which the future of our own species is at stake. The governments of the world have at last begun to take the global environment seriously. It's no longer a question of simply protecting a threatened species, but rather of conserving the so-called hotspots of biodiversity, areas which contain the largest percentage of animal and plant species on our planet. And in order to determine these vital bastions, the scientific community, non-governmental organizations, and some large financial companies are at long last combining forces. Organizations like International Conservation or the Field Museum in Chicago have since 1989 been organizing the so-called RAPS or Rapid Assessment Programs which sample the biological wealth of certain endangered areas in order to determine whether they are hotspots which should be protected. 
At the same time, large pharmaceutical companies are financing the preservation of areas of tropical forest in order to be able to investigate in them in search of new drugs. This bioprospecting, as it has been called, turns the conservation of the jungle into a profitable asset for the country that owns it. Initiatives are now being put into practice, but in order to be successful, they must take into account the time factor. The biodiversity hotspots are extremely fragile places, and so in many cases, such as the islands of independent evolution, the measures that must be taken in order to reverse their deterioration will not work unless they can bring results in the short term. In Madagascar, an island which became independent of the African continent 165 million years ago, 90% of the plant species and 83% of the animal species are endemic. That is, they cannot be found in any other part of the world. This gives them the value of uniqueness, but also makes them dependent on their exclusive surroundings in such a way that the loss of a single species can set off a chain reaction leading to the disappearance of many others. Here, every single living being is vital and irreplaceable. And every form of life, however insignificant it may seem, is unique and unrepeatable. These places, this marvelous variety of species, reach their present condition over the course of 165 million years of solitary evolution. But the 2,000 years that man has been on the island have been enough to cause the disappearance of many of them. And today, with the massive destruction of their habitats, we could wipe out the majority of those remaining in barely a couple of decades. As we saw in the previous episode, since the arrival of our species in Madagascar, the island has lost around 80% of its original plant coverage. In just the second half of the 20th century, half of all tropical jungles have disappeared, having been turned into low-yielding crop fields. And now, when the international community is realizing the danger of irreversibly losing this unique place, where independent evolution has been developing, we do not know if there will be time to put into practice the measures to save the last Madagascan jungles and all the unique species that inhabit them. And once again, the solution is twofold. First of all, save the most threatened species, and in the medium term, ensure that conservation produces wealth for the extremely poor Madagascan people. While new technologies and international funds help the populations to develop more productive ecological harvests, a program which brings together over 30 zoological organizations from all around the world is studying and breeding the most threatened species in order to ensure their survival. The origin of the central tenet of the new conservation can be found on the other side of the world, in the British island of Jersey. It was here that work began that would revolutionize the traditional concept of zoologists. And this we owe to the enterprising work of the zoologist Gerald Durrell. Durrell managed to turn into a reality his dream of creating a zoo in which the most threatened species in the world could be bred in order to then repopulate their original habitats. But his work went much further. Jersey Zoo is simply the most visible part of the Jersey Wildlife Preservation Trust. 
Here, the public is made aware of the need to conserve the biodiversity of the planet. But behind the facilities and the animals of the zoo, a worldwide network of volunteers investigate species and their natural requirements, weighs up the threats to their habitats, and teaches the local populations about the value of the species that share the land with them. Quite a revolution in the field of world conservation, and one which demonstrates that old concepts and attitudes are changing, guided by new scientific investigations. Fire along the edges of the Costa Rican jungle. Fire has always been considered the worst enemy of the forest. Why, therefore, are the perpetrators happily walking around the interior of a national park like this one, Santa Rosa? New knowledge has led to new changes. This, a team of volunteers from the National Park Service of Costa Rica, sets light to the pasture and deforested areas with two intentions to instruct new volunteers in the fight against fire and to enrich the soil for a slow, gradual regeneration to the original jungle. Because we now know that fire, which can destroy entire jungles, in certain circumstances plays a revitalizing role. On the other side of the Pacific Ocean in Australia, Vast grasslands provide shelter and food to many different marsupial species. These prairies, which arose with the warming of the island on its solitary drift northwards, were periodically and in a natural way engulfed by flames. With the arrival of the Europeans, these fires were fought in the belief that they were in all cases destructive. But in recent years, scientists have started to change their opinion discovering something that the Australian Aborigines have long known. In certain areas, fires revitalize the soil and the plant populations that colonize it, regenerating the carbon cycle and renewing the entire plant community. These deliberate fires are carried out under control in national parks all around the world. Scientific knowledge is proving to be a superb weapon in conservation. But this would serve for little without another vital pillar of the new conservation, raising the awareness and understanding of the local inhabitants. For years now, the logging companies have been devastating the jungles of Southeast Asia. Here in Borneo, the jungles which barely 30 years ago covered 90% of the territory were so extraordinary that the island is one of the greatest bastions of land biodiversity. Today, however, they have been cut down and burnt on such a scale that Borneo has now lost that status. The destruction of the jungles also meant the destruction of their species many of them endemic and threatened. Once again, the dependency among them reveals the danger of destroying the fabric on which life is based. For the orangutans, whose diet includes over 400 different types of fruits, leaves, flowers and barks, the loss of the jungle meant they were left without food and therefore were condemned to rapid extinction.
But fortunately for the jungle and for the orangutans, these large simians have attracted the admiration and sympathy of the public, and they are now the most visible image of conservationism in Borneo, the last hope for its threatened jungles. Everything began when Barbara Harrison from the Sarawak Museum had the idea of rescuing the orphaned orangutans captured by the logging companies and teaching them to fend for themselves in the wild. The task was not easy because the orangutans have a very long childhood during which they depend entirely on their mothers who teach them not only what to eat but also how to obtain and prepare their food. This, however, did not discourage Barbara Harrison. After 50 years of work, her initiative has given rise to the Sepilok Orangutan Rehabilitation Center. The work of the center is bringing results which go further than the reintroduction of the orangutans, because from here they are starting to make citizens and governments aware of the need to conserve the last jungles of Borneo. And the key, once again, is that people come here, attracted by these expressive primates that remind us so much of our own species. The tourists that come to Sepilok are changing the way of thinking of the local people. The visitors not only leave money, but also demonstrate the admiration and the interest the natural heritage of the island arouses around the world. The logging companies that caused the fires that have devastated the jungles of Borneo have been left without the support of the governments of the island, who are starting to hand over the concessions to NGOs willing to pay in order to conserve. These NGOs demonstrate that conservation can be profitable and open the eyes of politicians and local people who are starting to see the jungles as a form of life insurance. As deforestation is reduced, some species that seemed condemned to extinction are once again given hope for the future. Animals like this Sumatran rhinoceros, the oldest and most threatened of the five species of rhinoceros in the world, have very slowly started to increase in number. And as they see that the jungles have a tangible value, the local people who previously burned the ground in order to obtain a couple of poor harvests now participate in the reforestation of the devastated lands. These are the plantations of new jungles, jungles that will be possible to rationally exploit, bringing profit to the people that live in them, local people who will protect them and care for them for what they are, their greatest asset. And little by little, the miracle seems to be becoming a reality, and new jungles are starting to be planted where, for generations, they had been cut down and burned.
Global ecological problems require measures which are urgent but which will only bring results in the long term. Until these results materialize, local initiatives are managing to maintain species and ecosystems with direct, one-off measures that allow time for the more important global measures to take effect. The African elephants are a good example. While fighting for a total ban on the ivory trade, which would bring an end to poaching, while corridors are being created between parks in order to permit the movement of the herds, and while local populations are educated and involved in the care of the pachyderms, an enterprising woman is managing to recover the orphans of poaching. skirts of Nairobi in Kenya, the Daphne Sheldrake Animal Orphanage takes in the little pachyderms that have lost their families. Elephants have a very complex social life, so the little ones need a great deal of care to replace that given by their mothers. Here in the orphanage they receive just that, but the result of this project goes beyond the recovery of these little elephant calves. In the orphanage, which is open to the public, people can gain some idea of the fascinating life of elephants, discovering their complex social structure, and through this knowledge, understand the senseless brutality of shooting them. The orphanage also takes in other colossal orphans. Both species of African rhinoceroses are threatened. Their horns, mistakenly believed to be aphrodisiacs, have made them the prime target of the poachers. As in the case of the elephants, every year this poaching leaves behind orphans. And like them, the little rhinoceroses also receive shelter and care in Daphne's orphanage. In this way, the seeds of a new awareness are sown. Each visitor that comes to the orphanage learns to love the orphans of Sheldrick. And elephants and rhinoceroses win friends in their desperate fight for survival. Friends on whom their future will depend. Some species, however, find it much more difficult to gain the sympathy of man. The wolf has been part of our nightmares since we were children. We have been taught to fear them, to avoid them, to hate them. For centuries we have persecuted them as an enemy, mercilessly hunting them down. Perhaps at some point in the distant past, we were their prey. Then we became the hunter. And now we are finally trying to learn to live alongside them, sharing and respecting our respective roles as super predators. Yellowstone National Park was created in order to avoid the extinction of the American buffalo. It was the first national park in history and is now the pioneer in the reintroduction of the wolf. When the park was created in 1872, there were still gray wolves in Yellowstone. But in a farming region like this, the wolves were enemies and were hunted down until none remained. A century later, the United States Fish and Wildlife Service decided to repair the damage and capture some individuals in Canada 
in order to bring them to Montana. And with the help of his former enemy, the wolf returned to Yellowstone. After years of preparation in 1995, 14 individuals were brought from British Columbia and the next year another 17. There were many obstacles to be overcome, but the greatest one was ensuring the wolves did not leave the park and enter the cattle ranches in the surrounding area. Too much effort had been put into convincing the people of the region, and they weren't going to spoil all that by trying to go too fast now. So the wolves were released progressively, after having remained in captivity in enclosures inside the park, and after having placed radio collars on them in order to be able to track them at all times. The experiment was a success and has benefited the ecosystem as a whole. Today over 120 wolves live in Yellowstone, exercising their role as a super predator. All the species in the park have been affected and as was foreseen for the better. Populations of herbivores such as the North American elks, moose, pronghorns and buffaloes are now much healthier. The plant communities have improved as the excessive pressure of the herbivores has progressively diminished and large predators like the grizzly bear have increased in number as they can feed on the prey caught by the wolves. The entire park appears to be healthier each year more and more approaching its natural ecological equilibrium. What once seemed impossible has now become a reality. Man has put back what he had previously taken from the park, its great hunter, the top of the food pyramid. And today, once more, the shadow of the wolf can be felt in Yellowstone. In the coral reefs too, winds of hope are also blowing. Alerted by the critical situation they have reached, scientists from all around the world have set to work to save the coral reefs. In Australia, where we find the Great Barrier Reef, the largest coral reef in the world, Investigators are raising the alarm worldwide, warning of the deterioration due to the general warming of our atmosphere. But while the macro measures are taken at world level and until they produce results, Australian investigators are undertaking practical initiatives to minimize the damage to coral communities. Based on the data obtained from the meticulous research projects, the scientific community provides the government agencies with the knowledge that marks the new laws for the care and protection of the coral reefs. These laws are of immediate application, and here in Australia, they are achieving encouraging results. Once again, education and awareness raising are central in this new conservationist spirit. Educating the tourists that come to the Great Barrier Reef means recruiting defenders of the coral community. The visitors are shown how to behave in the world of the corals, 
so they will not damage them, but what is more important, they are made to understand, value and admire the fragile world of the reef, knowing that anything we admire, we love, and anything we love, we defend and conserve. This new trend, which we could sum up as educate in order to conserve, can boast an entire army of volunteers in Australia. In Cairns, in northeast Australia, the biologist Paddy Colwell gives free classes on the coral reef. What is important is that people should admire the reef, understand how it works, the role it plays, and how terribly fragile it is. The rest is a growing chain of admirers of this submerged world, people who add their grain of sand to the world conservation of the reefs. The great influx of international tourists to the Great Barrier Reef means that the message of people like Paddy Cowell is spread all around the world. It is a new way of making people aware and the best way to do so. Following the theory, the realities experienced beneath the water, the threatened species surround you, you can touch them, marvel at them. Learning about how the reef functions is important. Seeing its species leads you to admire it. But it is here, feeling and touching it firsthand, that you truly understand its intrinsic importance. After these experiences, when the divers leave Australia, they take with them lasting memories of the reef as a world which is vital to conserve. On the other side of the world, from the Great Barrier Reef, another desperate fight to save marine ecosystems is winning important battles. On board an old sailing ship, Ana Cañadas and Ricardo Sagarminaga have for years been fighting for the conservation of the Mediterranean Sea and its species. Together they form ALNITAC, an NGO for the study and conservation of Mediterranean ecosystems. The task they face will only be successful if they can manage to make the populations that live from the Mediterranean aware of the need for conservation. It is a complicated mission, but ALNITAC has found powerful allies, the cetaceans. With the help of the dolphins and whales, Ricardo and Ana are managing to get their message across to society. The dolphins and the charismatic Tofte Vag, the organization's ship, have become excellent messengers to get across to the public information about the marine environment and the problem it faces. Over 10 years of research and planning are starting to bring results and they are now much closer to achieving their goal of a marine reserve for cetaceans in the Alboran Sea. Much of the success of Alnitak is due to their approach of dividing their work into two major areas of action. On the one hand, they plan and develop research work aimed at alerting the scientific community to the problems of the Mediterranean. 
And on the other hand, at the same time, they develop social communication strategies that make the public, the coastal communities that live from the sea and its riches, aware of the moral and practical need to conserve the marine ecosystem with each and every one of its species. The cetaceans, especially the dolphins and pilot whales, play an essential role in this second objective. We all feel attracted by these intelligent, sociable animals. They are therefore efficient emissaries of all the problems suffered by their environment. Undoubtedly, we will be more sympathetic to the problems of the dolphins or pilot whales like these than by those suffered by gorgonians, gobies or jellyfish. But as the problems of the ecosystems affect all their species, these privileged messengers can raise awareness among the public, and this benefits all the creatures of the sea. Once again, new strategies are bringing global results. These emissaries of the sea have become the hope of thousands of species. It is no longer a question of protecting a certain animal, but rather of saving entire ecosystems. And in some cases, as in the Mediterranean Sea, it is specific species that hold the key to the hearts and minds of human societies. Scientific knowledge has revealed to us the importance of each species within the ecosystem. Conservationist trends have taught us the need to raise public awareness to make everyone understand the importance of all ecosystems and their species. But the reality, the pragmatic vision of the world makes it clear that we will only manage to conserve that which in one way or another brings benefits for the local inhabitants. Conservationism is a concept that was born in the developed countries where the basic needs of the population do not directly depend on their natural surroundings. These countries have, in general, lost the majority of their natural heritages and look to those of developing countries with logical concern. But with what moral authority can we prohibit something which our society has had to do in order to reach its current stage of development? How can we prevent areas from being cut down, hunted, burnt or drained if what is at stake is food for their families? How can we explain to them the natural treasure they own if they are worried about their very survival? How can we make them respect threatened animals if they are a danger to the lives of their children or the cattle on which they depend? Here on the plains of Venezuela, we find a revealing example. The region of Los Llanos is divided into atos, large cattle ranches where zebras and horses are free to roam, looked after by a few cattle herders. The lands remain in their original state because they have traditionally been used for extensive cattle rearing. For years, this has been the only way to exploit these lands. 
and so their owners have left them just as they were, making them the final refuge of many Amazon species in danger of extinction. But these plains are not rich territory for cattle rearing, and the animals suffer great limitations and diseases which make them less and less profitable. The situation could bring changes which would lead to ranches being used for other more lucrative activities. But year after year, the intact nature of this austere land is progressively becoming its main source of income. International conservationist organizations finance research projects on the ranches for the study and protection of threatened species, injecting foreign currency into an economically depressed area. There are now biological stations on the cattle ranches, stations that bring money which is compatible with cattle rearing. And some species have immediately benefited from this. The Orinoco crocodile was, until recently, a mortal enemy for the inhabitants of this region. The reptiles killed their cattle and were a potential danger to people, given their size and aggressiveness, and so they were hunted down almost to the point of extinction. Today, on ranches like El Frio, the Orinoco crocodiles are being studied and protected, and programs of breeding in captivity and repopulation have been carried out in areas devastated by the cattle herders. This study area where scientists and conservationists from all over the world develop their programs on the ground receives a considerable injection of finance for the most threatened species, turning them into a profitable asset. The owners win, the conservationists win, science and knowledge win, and the crocodile, of course, wins. It is not surprising, therefore, that the population of Orinoco crocodiles have started a slow but promising recovery on the ranches of the plains of Venezuela. Another crocodile, larger and more dangerous than the Orinoco crocodile, has also been saved thanks to the economic returns it has begun to generate. Measuring up to eight meters in length, the saltwater crocodile is the largest reptile in the world. Its aggressiveness has earned it the name of devourer of men, and its strength has made it a god and demon for the natives of Southeast Asia and Oceania. The Australian Aborigine god, Ginka, the demon of the crocodile men of New Guinea, the nightmare of the first Australian colonists. With good reason, it has been feared by all. In these waters, no one is safe from this powerful dragon, which, however, lost its invincibility with the arrival of firearms. Indiscriminate hunting almost entirely wiped out the saltwater crocodile. But then a new alternative occurred to the Australian naturalists and farmers, an alternative that would save the life of the species.
The crocodile farms were the paradoxical salvation of these powerful reptiles. The owners of the lands through which the rivers containing crocodiles flowed killed them due to the danger they represented for them and their cattle. But the crocodile farms pay considerable amounts for the eggs of these animals, and the landowners have begun to consider the crocodiles as simply another source of income. On the other hand, on the farms they incubate the eggs, and some of the animals are returned to their natural habitat after the first days of their lives when the crocodiles are most vulnerable. And at the same time, they obtain more eggs on the same farms, because some adult females are used for breeding. Obviously, for all this, the crocodiles have had to pay a very high price. The skin of the estuarine crocodiles is the best leather in the world, and for this skin great amounts of money are paid. But even so, for the saltwater crocodile, the overall balance is favorable, and for the crocodile farmers too, because along with the leather, new sources of income have appeared in the form of tourism. On the same farms where they sell the crocodile skin, they are starting to put on shows so the public can get to know and admire this powerful reptile. There are 40 saltwater crocodiles, of which there are 20 males and And here too, the scientists contracted by the farms carry out important studies which help in the conservation of their populations in the wild. And the talks and teachings of the monitors on the farms show how to avoid attacks by the super predator while they educate people to admire and value the surviving relic from past eras. This is the cornerstone of the new conservation, the hope for threatened species and ecosystems, tourism which is willing to pay considerable amounts of money in order to enjoy the last natural areas still remaining in their original state. A different kind of tourism is spreading around the entire world. These new travelers go in search of re-encounters with nature, feeling the ancestral pull of our origins, the irresistible call of virgin lands. New infrastructure opens up many of these places to ecotourism, allowing children and the elderly to also enjoy them. Every day, new natural areas are opened up to tourism. Former areas of hunting and deforestation are now visited by nature lovers who finance their conservation. And travelers can approach species that just a few years ago they would have believed to be dangerous and fearsome. These new travelers are discovering a friendlier, more accessible nature. Ancient monsters are now greatly appreciated by these daring tourists, and well-trained guides dispel extremely widespread taboos, showing the reality of nature and her species. The income earned from ecological tourism goes beyond the new conservation. 
The new ecotourism projects also take into consideration the local native communities, who are given priority in their management. From these communities come the guides and guards of the reserves, the owners of the accommodation in which the tourists stay, the craftsmen who sell them souvenirs. Sources of income that have changed the attitude of local people. Former poachers have become reserve wardens, and those who were forced to burn and cut down in order to obtain a miserable harvest now watch over the forest that feeds their community and are paid to do so. Winds of hope are blowing for nature, which stands on the very edge of the abyss. And a common promising future is now opening up for the last natural sanctuaries and their inhabitants, including the most controversial and adaptable species of all, the only one that has the capacity to correct its mistakes, us human beings. <laughs>